your guide to zucchini squash. As a summer variety, zucchini is harvested before its rind hardens, unlike winter squashes. It can be consumed either raw or cooked and is very high in potassium. It's a versatile and delicious vegetable, making a great addition to all your favorite dishes. Before we get started, let's learn a little bit about zucchini squash. Summer squash. In addition to describing the time of planting, summer squash refers to their short storage life, unlike that of winter squashes. Summer squash grows on non-vining bushes. Check out all of your options. Zucchini open pollinated. Black zucchini. Best known as a summer squash, it has green black skin and white flesh. Black Beauty, a slender dark black green variety with slight ridges. Cocazeal, a long slender variety that's dark green overlaid with light green stripes. Vegetable Marrow White Bush, this variety is creamy greenish in color with an oblong shape. Zucchini Hybrid. Aristocrat, a waxy medium green variety. Chefini, a glossy medium dark green colored zucchini. Classic, a medium green variety that's compact and grows as an open bush. Golden Zucchini Hybrid. Gold Rush, this variety is deep gold in color with superior fruit quality. Transplanting is possible, but direct seeding is best when starting squash. Summer squash likes warm soils, and it's very sensitive to frost, so don't rush to plant early in the spring. Wait until all danger of frost has passed and your soil has warmed up to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly two weeks after the last frost. Sow your seeds about a half inch deep planting two to three seeds every two to three feet in the row. After they've emerged, cut the extra plants with scissors, leaving only the single strongest plant. Then, thin seedlings to stand eight to 12 inches apart. A hill of three to four seeds sown closely together is another way to plant your squash in the garden. Just make sure to allow five to six feet between hills. You can also sow your squash seeds indoors using three inch diameter containers. If you choose this option, you'll want to start your transplants about three weeks before planting time. As well, both seeds and transplants can be planted through black plastic to speed up their maturity. If using transplants, be sure to handle them gently and avoid disturbing their root system. In this section, we'll tell you everything you need to know about ideal growing conditions, how to water and weed your zucchini squash, and how to mulch and fertilize it. We'll also talk transplanting, companion planting, and your growing structure options. For germination, zucchini squash prefer temperatures that are between 60 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. They won't germinate in cold soil, so you'll want to wait to plant until your soil reaches at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit, preferably 70 degrees Fahrenheit or more, while it germinates best at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Their ideal soil pH is between 6.0 to 7.5, but it will grow in soils with a pH of up to 8.0. Typically, zucchini squash take about five to 10 days to germinate. Pollination. An insect, like bees, must move pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers. Cold, rain, and cloudy weather can hurt their pollination efforts. So if you have tasteless fruit, that could be due to dark, cloudy weather. Note, many squashes will produce male flowers for one to two weeks before you notice the first female flower. This is a normal growth habit 
and it varies with different varieties. The female flowers, which open later, have a swelling at their base, which forms the fruit, also known as the ovary. Watering. Water your zucchini squash deeply and regularly at the base of each plant. It's especially important to water them during hot, dry weather, and also once the first fruits start to form. Weeding. Remove all young weedlings either by hand or with a hoe, and use a mulch around plants to keep weed seeds from growing. Fertilizer. Side dress with a quarter pound of a 10 to 10 to 10 fertilizer per 10 feet of row. You'll want to do this about four weeks after blossoming begins. Soil that has plenty of compost or well-rotted manure is ideal, but good crops can also grow in average soils that have been fertilized enough. Zucchini squashes are also heavy feeders, which means you'll want to prepare your planting bed with lots of organic matter. Use a few inches of aged compost, spread it across the bed, and then turn it under. If your plant leaves become pale or your plants seem weak, side dress your zucchini with well-aged compost. You can also use a foliar spray of liquid fish or kelp fertilizer. Just make sure it's high in phosphorus for good fruit production. As well, don't use a fertilizer that's too high in nitrogen because it will reduce your yield. Mulch. Use row covers to protect your plants early in the season and also to prevent insect problems. Be sure to remove this cover before flowering so that bees can pollinate your plants. You'll also want to remove it when hot weather arrives so that your zucchini squashes aren't exposed to too much heat. Mulching your plants helps to retain moisture and suppress any weeds. As well, mounding soil around the base of your plants can discourage squash borers from laying their eggs, which would become a problem for your squash later on. Transplanting best practices. Before you transplant, make sure to harden off your seedlings by cutting back on their water and reducing their temperature. Then set them outside for a few hours each day, keeping them sheltered at first. This helps to prepare them for outside living, reducing the risk of transplant shock and stress. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's. Radishes are good companion plants for zucchini, as radishes help repel common zucchini pests like aphids, squash bugs, cucumber beetles, and more. As well, a few garlic plants tucked among your zucchini can help keep aphids and other pests in check. Since zucchini plants are heavy feeders, legumes like beans and peas are beneficial because their roots fix nitrogen in the soil. Herbs like peppermint, dill, mint, parsley, and oregano are also great companions for your zucchini. Don'ts. Avoid planting your zucchini with the following vegetables. Potatoes, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collard, kale, kohlrabi, and sweet potato. Growing structure options. Raised beds. These ensure good water drainage, which your zucchini crops need. Ideally, their soil should be able to retain moisture while also having ample drainage, so raised beds are a great option. Outdoor containers. Zucchinis need large containers to accommodate them, as well as frequent watering. Containers for transplants. In general, three inch diameter containers will work for growing your transplants. Biodegradable pots. These can be set directly into the ground at planting time, which avoids disturbing the roots of your plant. Plastic mulch covers. Earlier planting is possible if you use black plastic mulch, which raises the soil temperature since the black color of the mulch will also absorb heat from the sun. Apply black mulch after you prepare your soil in the spring. Simply cut holes or slits in the mulch, then plant your seeds. After seedlings have emerged, position some row covers over your plants, securing the edges with soil or staples. Spun row covers. They raise the air temperature around your plants and protect them from cold nights. Row covers also keep away insects, 
the bad and the good. So once your squash starts to flower, be sure to remove these covers so that bees and other beneficial insects can pollinate your plants. There are a number of pests and diseases that can potentially harm your zucchini squash. Potential pests. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days, or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects, like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants, turning them into skeleton leaves that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies, like wasps and flies, to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. This is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for army worms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any army worms off the plants. Cucumber beetle. Brightly colored pests with either a green-yellow body with black spots or alternating black and yellow stripes. Typically, the adults will feed on leaves. Meanwhile, its larvae will burrow into the roots and stems. Cucumber beetles can then stunt the growth of seedlings and cause damage to a plant's leaves and stems. Eventually, plants will wilt and die. Here's what to do. Floating row covers can be used to protect plants from cucumber beetle damage, but these row covers will need to be removed once the plants are flowering to allow bees to pollinate. Applying kaolin clay can also be an effective solution against small numbers of beetles. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, 
remove plant residue to help reduce egg-laying sites, and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Squash bugs. These pests cause leaves to turn speckled yellow and brown. Plants that are affected by squash bugs will wilt, the plant's runners will die back, and the squash fruit can either become spotted or it dies off entirely. Here's what to do. Destroy all crop residue as soon as possible, either after harvest or after a plant dies. Also, apply row covers when planting and use insecticidal soap. White flies. These pests are known for their white bodies and wings, and for hanging out on the undersides of leaves. They feed on the leaves of a plant, causing damage that makes the plant susceptible to other diseases. These pesky flies will typically group together on the undersides of leaves, and then the flies will fly up when disturbed. Here's what to do. Remove any affected leaves, or the whole plant, if it's severely infested. Introduce beneficial insects, like ladybugs, spiders, lacewing larvae, and dragonflies into the garden. Use yellow sticky traps and apply insecticidal soaps or oils. Keep in mind that these oils, like neem oil, might reduce white fly numbers, but they won't eliminate them entirely. Potential diseases. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. 
This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease resistant seeds when possible and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Circospora leaf spot. Small spots with light to tan centers will first appear on the older leaves of plants. As the disease progresses, the centers of these lesions might become brittle and could possibly crack, while older infected leaves can yellow and die. When exposed to high humidity, the lesions will appear fuzzy. Here's what to do. To control the spread of Circospora leaf spot, Avoid planting susceptible crops within 100 yards of a previously infected spot. Till any infected crops to bury them, as well as fungal residue, which will prevent the disease from staying in the soil and carrying over into future plantings. However, if any plants are badly infected, pull them out, then hot compost those diseased plants, a method that involves burning compost. It's also best to practice crop rotation so that the soil can be protected, which helps prevent continuous disease and pest outbreaks. Also, apply a dense organic mulch, like grass clippings or compost around plants, then water around their base, not overhead. It can also be helpful to spray plants with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon of baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and a teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water. Keep in mind that baking soda might burn some plant leaves, so it's best to spray one or two leaves first and then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Neem oil can also be sprayed on plants, but just make sure not to use it when pollinating insects, like bees and other beneficial insects are around the garden. As well, sulfur sprays or copper-based fungicides can be applied weekly at the first sign of this disease to prevent the disease's spread. These organic fungicides will not kill leaf spot entirely, but they will prevent the fungal spores from germinating and spreading. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes, those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day 
making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Fusarium crown and foot rot. The wilting of leaves eventually progresses to the wilting of your entire plant, which then dies within a few days. When an infected plant is uprooted, it will have a distinct brown rot on the crown and roots. As well, plants will break easily below the soil line. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Fusarium thrives in hot temperatures when the soil moisture is low. So because of this, make sure to keep your soil evenly moist, especially in the hottest months of the season. Try to do so without flooding your garden, which can create a breeding ground for other diseases and pests. Solarizing any affected soil can also help to kill off this fungus. Simply cover the affected soil with black plastic and leave it undisturbed during the warm season. The sun, along with the plastic, will then heat up the soil, killing the fungus in the process. Powdery mildew. Small white patches will appear on the upper and lower leaf surfaces, which might also show some purple blotching. Patches often come together to form a dense powdery layer, coating the leaves and causing the leaves to curl inward. In some cases, eventually the leaves will drop from the plant. Typically, the white patches start on the older leaves and then eventually spread to other plant parts. Powdery mildew is brought on by high humidity and moderate temperatures, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 to 27 degrees Celsius, with symptoms becoming most severe in shaded areas. As well, this disease often acts as an entry point for other pests and diseases. Here's what to do. First, rotate crops so that members of the same family aren't planted in the same spot year after year. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. Plant disease-resistant varieties when possible, and then provide good air circulation by not crowding the plants and by eliminating weeds. Water plants in the morning to give them enough time to dry out, taking care not to get the plant's leaves wet. Consider spraying infected plants with certain protectant, preventative fungicides. Sulfur, lime sulfur, neem oil, and potassium bicarbonate are all effective, but these remedies will work best when they are used before the infection happens or when signs of the disease are first spotted. Instead of chemical fungicides, plants can also be sprayed with a bicarbonate solution by simply mixing one teaspoon of baking soda in one quart of water. Make sure to spray the plants thoroughly, since the solution will only kill fungi that it comes into contact with. Also, potassium bicarbonate, which is similar to baking soda, can actually eliminate powdery mildew once it's there and does the job fairly quickly. As well, after the growing season, make sure to dispose of any infected leaves or fruit. Once plants are heavily infected with powdery mildew, it's difficult to get rid of the disease. So focus on preventing it from spreading to other plants. Blossom end rot. Symptoms will first appear on immature fruits 
as small light brown spots close to the blossom end of the fruit. As the fruit grows, the spots enlarge, turning into dark leathery lesions that are sunken into the fruit. Here's what to do. Maintain consistent watering and keep your soil evenly moist. Mulch your plants to help them retain water. Straw or black plastic will do the trick. Excess nitrogen also causes blossom end rot on zucchini squash because it blocks the absorption of calcium. As a result, you'll want to avoid high nitrogen fertilizers as well as ammonia fertilizers, like fresh manure. If your plant is already showing signs of end rot in its early fruiting phase, you might have to add calcium into the soil. Keep in mind though that calcium isn't taken in well by the leaves, so avoid using a foliar spray. Calcium needs to go directly to the roots, so calcium carbonate tablets, or anti-acid tablets like Tums, can be placed into the soil at the base of your plant. Cucurbit Yellow Stunting Disorder Virus Yellow to brown spotting typically appears first, which eventually leads to severe yellowing. Infected leaves might roll upward and become brittle, while the infected plant can appear stunted. Here's what to do. Since this disease is mainly spread by white flies, you'll want to make sure you control their numbers. As well, maintain healthy and vigorous plants. When possible, plant recommended varieties and monitor your garden for any unusual symptoms as they happen. Keep your garden area clear of weeds because they can harbor pesky insects. Choosing separate areas for early and late plantings can also help to minimize the severity of the disease in those late plantings. Harvesting. Harvest when your squash is still immature. Once it's about six to eight inches long and 1.5 to two inches in diameter for elongated types. If the rind is too hard to be pierced by your thumbnail, then it's over mature. If that happens, simply remove the old fruit to allow the new fruit to develop. You'll want to check your plants daily once they begin to bear fruit. To speed up the first harvest by as much as two weeks, Use some black plastic mulch to warm your soil before directly seeding or transplanting. Keep in mind that early fruits are sometimes wrinkled and can turn black or even rot due to poor pollination. Storage. Zucchini squash will keep for five to 14 days in cool, 32 degrees to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, moist, 90% relative humidity conditions. The longer you store summer squash, the more likely it can be damaged by the cold. If it is affected by the cold, it will develop pitted skin and water-soaked flesh.